Welcome to the Growth Minded Accountant Podcast, where our experts will share best practices on running your firm in the digital age. This podcast is brought to you by Counting Works Pro. Let's get started. All right. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of the Growth Minded Accountant Podcast. My name is Lee Reeves II, and I am founder and CEO of Counting Works. Today, we are talking about focusing on launching and growing a payroll specialty practice. Uh, if you are a, a, a listener of mine, you know we talk a lot about niching down and how s- specialties can provide uh, more lucrative revenue for you, basically. So the theme today is how to scale a payroll business from scratch. We are joined today by Charles Reed, CPA. He's the founder of Custom Payroll uh, Associates and Get Payroll. So welcome, Charles. Let's get started with a quick intro on your background and why you specialize in payroll services for small and medium-sized businesses. Early, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I started this firm 31 years ago as a mobile accounting service with a payroll sideline. Uh, we grew the business. I took on a partner. About 10 years ago, I sold off the accounting practice to him. Uh, we only do payroll now. Uh, we uh, gotten tired of accounting and taxes. I still do a little tax work on the side for myself and my friends, but that's it. Uh, so he's got the whole practice now. But we do account, we do payroll and payroll-related services for small and medium-sized businesses. We grew it from just a, a few clients to a substantial business uh, that makes me a nice living uh, and provides for all my staff as well. So it's it's been a, a 30-year journey and we've enjoyed it. So talking about the decision then, because many of my, in my audience, they are, they run CPA firms. A lot of them I can consider generalists where they try to do everything for everybody. Um, what made you decide, hey, I want to split out and, and just concentrate on the payroll side versus trying to do a lot of things for clients? Well, I'd, I'd gone to the same conferences as a CPA, okay? And you can do all this, you can do all that. I actually went and got my securities license uh, my series seven and 66. And I realized very quickly, I could not possibly keep up on the market and keep up on taxes. So I couldn't service my clients effectively in both areas. So I dropped the, the financial planning side. Uh, and then as the business grew, I realized I couldn't handle payroll and all the payroll tax problems and employment tax problems and HR and all the things that go with it effectively and be a tax person over here doing monthly accounting and corporate and personal taxes. I I can't do it all. Uh, You know, even in accounting, there were times somebody come to me about, you know, international transfer pricing. I'd send them down to Price Waterhouse. (laughs) That was for for, for me to comment on that to them would have been malpractice. Okay. So uh, I just had to decide what was more fun for me. Uh, and would produce, uh, you know, a nice living. Um, and so I chose here 10 years ago to give up the accounting and the tax and to concentrate on payroll. And I've not regretted that decision at all. If you, you, you either have to bring in people, partners basically, that handle that area of the business and you give up control of it, or you have to narrow your focus. Uh, you can't be everything to everybody. Uh, As much as I liked that concept, uh, it became unsupportable here uh, after about 10 years in the business. It just, it it wasn't possible to do everything. (laughs) Well, it's interesting because I think especially, you know, post-pandemic, the accounting firms have been leaned on more than ever. And I think they're finding their heads are spinning. They're so busy. They're being pulled in so many directions. And when you have multiple different clients coming on, Each new client, you basically have to learn, you know, what is their specialty? What are their needs? I have to learn that from a, um, from my expertise point of view. So instead of basically having a similar service where I know the answers and the questions to ask before my client even asks them, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm so versed on this that basically I can do my business in fewer hours. One of the things you said that I appreciate is the passion side. So we try to, advise our professionals, our accountants, that if you, when you're niching down, find something that you are passionate about. So what made payroll that passion point for you from your accounting firm? Well, there's a number of things that are involved. First of all, it's business to business. 
So I'm not dealing with consumers. Uh, and that's a different mindset. A businessman has a different mindset when it comes to money and taxes than a individual does. And I like dealing with the business mindset better than I do the consumer mindset. It is a repeat business. It is every week or every two weeks all year long. So you're constantly dealing with the same people over and over and over again, which allows you to get to know them and, and deal with them effectively and solve their problems. When they come in once a year, I don't, you know, when you're doing tax returns, you did it last, let me look at last year's tax return and see if anything in my notes rings a bell. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, so you have a much tighter side, client relationship is what you're saying. Absolutely. I've got clients that I've been dealing with for 30 years in payroll and they're friends. In many, in a number of cases, I'm dealing with their kids now because they've retired and the, the, the children have inherited the business. Uh, I've got several of those and that's, that's, that's fabulous. When my wife was in the hospital uh, after her first stroke, a number of clients, because she worked with me in the business, a number of clients came to visit her in the hospital because they consider her a friend. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's a good relationship. It's, it's much closer than, than a tax relationship to me and, and works for me. So uh, it's, it's a repeat business. It's, it's people you get to know. It's people you can help out. Uh, it's fun. All right. Well, it's fun. Let's talk about that. So you had mentioned about what's nice about it is having a recurring revenue stream. So it's it's similar to what I do is at CounterWorks Pro, we are a marketing automation software platform for tax and accounting firms. Our subscribers sign up for a monthly or an annual program. It's a monthly fee. Let's say it's 300 or it's whatever it is. And that kind of business is obviously um, more valuable in the long run because it's uh, you can actually forecast your revenue and each month you're not starting over again. So when you come up to a new client, do you, do you offer your services in packages? So is there like size A, B, C, or do you customize your quotes for each client or kind of explain to me, how do you package your, your services? You have packages. We can bundle things. I mean, if they need HR, we have HR. Uh, so we can package that. We have a number of other services that are available to them, uh, buying service, uh, prescription cards, uh, workers' comp, which we, we get a cut off of, of course, if we refer them through our workers' comp organization, uh, benefits, and so on. But it really is payroll. Uh, it's what we sell. Uh, the others are all add-ons, and a lot of clients pick those up over the years. So they're available, and we add new things. We try to be innovative. We just added crypto payroll, for instance. Yeah, I noticed that on your website. I wanted to talk about that, uh, but keep going. So uh, we were we were the first green payroll in in the nineties. Uh, we, we we try to be innovative. We try to be very much on the leading edge, not the cutting edge, but the leading edge of things. So we can give our clients uh, up to date stuff. But where 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 we work on, and one of the very important things for people who are doing payroll is compliance. And as a CPA, I got, I got into the compliance aspect and into the IRS. I spent three years on the IRS Advisory Council uh, learning a lot about the inside of the IRS. My partner who I had, who bought the accounting firm as an ex-IRS agent. So uh, payroll has gotten to the point where a lot of it is very computerized and relatively simple to do, but it's the compliance that is the killer and where the I consider my, my big competitors fail is handling the compliance issues that arise for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, the IRS makes millions of mistakes a year and you have to be prepared to deal with the service. I take a 2848 on every client that allows me to uh, advocate for my clients to and with the Internal Revenue Service, and if necessary, get powers attorneys for the states, um, because there's a lot of problems there. And the IRS, as we know, uh, is obsolete technology, didn't have the budget until a couple of days ago, which is going to take years to implement. 
you know, the technology, some of it's IBM computers running COBOL going back to the 1960s. The mistakes are everywhere all the time. Um, and as your clients realize, uh, you can't penalize a client for a simple mistake in an employment tax situation. It has to be gross negligence. But of course, the IRS defines gross negligence. So you have to be able to fight those things on a constant basis. And that's where the real work in payroll comes in now is not calculating the paycheck. I mean, almost all of our stuff is direct deposit, uh, ACH. Uh, we, we do very few checks per se. Uh, it's all electronic. Uh, our clients enter the hours electronically. We have timekeeping systems where they can put them in and it's all uh, seamless and all that works nicely. And, and we actually do more payrolls with less people. But it's the problems and the compliance that are the issue. and Every time Congress meets, uh, they change things. 75% of all federal revenue comes through payroll. So when they want to change revenue, they That's change they payroll. They change <laughs> payroll. Uh, very true. So a couple of things you said there I thought was interesting. I know Yellen came out, I think it was today, about giving the IRS six months to figure out how to spend the $80 billion dollars. Um, or the 80 plus or whatever it was. But it'll be interesting just to see how they can figure that out in the next six months to plan and then even figure out how you modernize things. I promise you, and I've had, I've had lunch several times with Chuck Reddick. Uh, I, I like Chuck. He's an outsider. He, he's a great guy. It will take them six months to put together a task force to discuss the issue. It'll take six months. And they expect that report in six months. <laughs> they won't get it. Right. It will take two years before they can really define everything. I mean, they can throw out a general outline tomorrow because they know where they want. They, they've been bitching in Congress for years about where they need more budget. Right. But in how they're going to spend $80 billion and hire 87,000 people who want to work for the IRS and our accountants or lawyers, uh, good luck. Well, especially I, I read a stat, I think like 50% are nearing uh, retirement age of staff in within, the IRS now. Yeah. Within three years of retirement. Right. Over 40% are within three years of retirement age. Yeah. So that's crazy what they're going to have to try to do, especially I don't know where the labor markets will be. But let's go back into compliance and some of the things that I, I find as a, a business owner. So pandemic compliance issues now, I used to I just have to worry about one state. I'm in California. You know, I have the IRS, I have California state issues. It was fairly simple. Now I have people all over the place, all over the country. Each state is different. Some states are insane, the amount of work and compliance and setting up. So explain to me like the challenges, uh, both to the CPA side, who is trying to do payroll for their clients, but also small business owners and trying to stay compliant. And, you know, each, each state is weird. And, you know, some you have to have three and four different approvals and accounts, and it's, it's, it's a big process. So kind of explain to me the challenges there. Well, and, and you've highlighted uh, many of them. Uh, every state is different. Uh, most of them have unemployment, and most of them have a revenue department for withholding. And then there's local uh, operations, particularly in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and up in the Northeast. Then there's cities like Kansas City, New York City, Philadelphia, you know, there, there's withholding tax for the school district in Philadelphia. Uh, it, yeah, it's insane. Uh, and some states are much more sophisticated than others. We have been fighting to get uh, online access for two of our clients in New Mexico for two years. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> the state of New York, the power of attorney so I can talk to them is five pages long and has to be notarized. Yeah, it's crazy. And that's just our, our staff uh, deals with that all the time, every day. Uh, we have good relationships with most of the states because we, we work with them and we get to know a contact. And once we find somebody we can work with in the state, uh, we get their phone number so we can call them back. <laughs> it, one thing that I learned is one thing setting up the accounts. The other thing is leaving. So meaning I had a uh, an intern that was in Iowa. I think it was Iowa, Indiana or Iowa. And she just worked for the summer. That was it. We hired her and then she left and you know she she went on her way, but she wasn't an employee. 
And I tried to can't, they would never, basically they kept sending me bills for her for years after she was gone. I would, yeah. I would cancel the account. I would tell them, um, you know, obviously this is her last day and they would just say, well, this, you know, this is what you owe. And it was, I mean, it was just a, a, a pit, you know, trying to figure that one out. So I don't think business owners appreciate the issues now with this, you know, the, the state line. So is there anything particular that you're advising clients? Are they, are your business, are your clients realizing, wow, you know, each time I hire someone in a new state, I have new exposure, right? It kind of, exp you know, what's your point of view on that? Well, we work with the clients and when they bring in, they, they call and they say, well, we hired Sally in Oklahoma or we hired Joe in North Dakota. We go through and sit down with them and say, okay, these things need to be filed in that state. You need to file with this, this department and you need to get this number and you need to file with this department and get this number. If you're in Ohio, you need to go to your local tax authority on and on and on. We, we counsel our clients with that because we're familiar with it. It's what we do for a living. Uh, they're not. They think they can just hire somebody uh, to work remote in, you know, wherever. You know, we get them hiring them in California, New York. And you may like California, but we find California rather hard to deal with. Uh, it is one, one location, but like Oregon, they have, you know, everything goes through, through one form. But uh, it's the, the government there is a little more difficult when you call them. Um, but every state's different. And yeah, you've got to be aware of it. And our biggest problem, of course, is clients don't know what they don't know. And they, they step on their toes. And they, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and they do things that then they expect us to fix. And we do. Uh, and in reality, when you deal with the states, a lot of them understand that that particularly in this day and age with all the remote work and so on, that there's a lot of confusion and, and a lot of new employers for them. And most of them are, are, are relatively reasonable to deal with, uh, provided you're professional about it. Uh, if you get upset and yell at them, they just stick it to you. <laughs> all right. Well, that's a, that's a good lesson. That's a takeaway from this. Uh, definitely understanding that. So, I want to get into a little bit about uh, building the practice. So you you spun it off ten years ago or so. Like, what is your primary growth strategy? Is it digital? Is from your website? Is it purely referrals? Kind of where are you getting most of your clients from? You have a large digital presence. Um, I do three to five podcasts a week. Um, we do videos. I've got a, a Michael is my videographer, and he does great work. We do holiday videos. We have a YouTube channel. We did a whole series of short Charlie the Bartender ones recently. We have fun with it. And we do a lot of educational ones. We also have a weekly uh, payroll news, which is uh, reporting on all the people that get caught and end up going to jail. Uh, so just beware things for clients. And we send that out to our email list, which grows daily. Uh, for your listeners, I will offer them when you're ready, a copy of my newest book, the payroll book, uh, which helps build my email list because these are people interested in payroll. Uh, so we do a lot of digital. We are now offering also White Label where we produce it for other accountants, uh, bookkeepers and so on in their name. And it allows them to share in the revenue substantially. Uh, and at the same time, looks like they're in the payroll business for their clients. Uh, we have that and we have a referral base. So we have clients that don't want to deal with the clients once they're in payroll, but they want a cut of the, the revenue and that's fine. So we offer them a uh, the, the payroll on an ongoing uh, cut of the revenue on an ongoing basis of forever. So as long as if they refer a client to us, we'll pay them a referral fee for the life of the client which our competitors don't. Our competitors will, will say, we'll give you 200 bucks if you send us a client. Well, we'll give you 10% of the billing forever. So it's a residual. We think it's a much better deal for our clients that refer people to us. So we have the white label and the referral. We do a lot of digital marketing. We don't do any more door-to-door. -door. ADP still sends their salespeople door-to-door. -door. 
I'm sorry, Frank Rambuskis, who was a friend of mine, wrote the book, you know, Cold Calling's Dead. Uh, and it is, and I think uh, ADP and Paychex make a serious mistake. They're trying to revolutionize their marketing, but they've got 5,000 salespeople apiece that they probably need to fire. But, you know, that's their problem, not mine. All right. So going to the buy-in for thought leadership, so content creation. So what we do for our clients is assist them with, you know, basically showcasing their expertise. How do you become a thought leader? And from that, there's all these benefits. So you have the SEO boost. So you're going to show up better on your search engine results. When yep. people are doing the research on who to work with, they're going to read these articles. They're going to watch your videos. They're going to feel like they a buy-in. They're already going to kind of trust you. So it does what we call the pre-selling for you. It sounds like that is kind of the methods you've been using, and it seems to be very successful. It, it is. We, we are very high on that. We're, we, we believe in the video very much. We do a lot of it. I, I've got a videographer whose job is to do nothing but to produce videos. That's what he does, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week. So uh, we, we do a lot of that. We believe in that. We are developing our thought leadership. We think that's a way to go. That's part of the reason I was on the IRS Advisory Council. That's part of the reason I wrote the payroll book. All these, the payroll book is my my business card now. Okay. Um, you know, and we will, and at the end, I'll I'll let you wrap it up, right. and you can tell our 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 uh, audience and, where to get that. But writing is is anything you can get out in the market that people can see, uh, whether it be articles, uh, it be blogs, it be videos, all these things that help develop. Uh, one of your clients as a thought leader in their area or their business or their niche uh, makes them far more viable. We get leads off of podcasts we do, okay? Uh, we do a podcast like this with you, and we appreciate the opportunity to do so. Uh, we may well get a client or more off of it. It's not unusual that we get clients that have seen the podcast and say, hey, Charles, I need to outsource payroll. Okay, great. Let me go ahead and talk to Pete, who's our, our, our business development manager, our salesman. And boom, there we go. So yeah, we love it. Yeah, and so it's evergreen. That is an important thing. Um, and evergreen, so what evergreen means to people that are, are not familiar, evergreen are things, uh, content that you can put out there that grows over time. And the reality is it's something that people, you know, if they access it today or three months or six months, it's still valuable. So it's not necessarily, let's say, a timely or news type article, though we have been experimenting with both. So we could develop evergreen content for our clients. We're also in our tax buzz marketplace. So that's kind of our community where we're putting together thought leaders and letting them share their information and articles online. We've been going uh, heavy and experimenting with the news feeds. So we started some news feeds. And it is remarkable the amount of volume and impressions our articles are getting and how many shares, how many comments. And at some point, that is for us an SEO boost. We have uh, all of our pros listed in their profiles on TaxBuzz, for example. So we're getting hundreds and hundreds, millions of people now in our ecosystem. And what that means to you as a pro, as an accountant, is exposure for your brand when people read our articles or you're mentioning the content. So it definitely 100% works. We find also doing podcasts, webinars as well, where we can count every week how many new clients we got from putting out this type of content. So I think I appreciate it, you know, your viewpoint and it, you're, you're successful at it as well. And I think that's an important thing that a lot of accountants don't put themselves out there enough. They don't blog, they don't create content. So what makes you, what gets you inspired and more comfortable to get in, in front of the camera and do this? Well, I, I was very lucky as a child, I was in drama. And so being in front of an audience, being in front of a camera is just was second nature. I started when I was six and did it all through high school. So to me, public speaking is simple and easy. It's not frightening. Uh, getting on a, a podcast like this, uh, doing Fox, uh, uh, Fox Business in the Morning with Maria, uh, doing other things, it's just easy for me. I'm comfortable with it. And I've grown much more comfortable over time. Practice makes perfect. Uh, I, my recommendation, obviously, is to anybody that has a problem with public speaking or getting on a podcast like this, go join Toast, Toastmasters. Uh, I, I did a few years ago just to revitalize my public speaking, and it was wonderful. 
and, and I recommend it highly. It's basically free. It's a few bucks a year, and it will get you in front of a friendly crowd that will help you get better at public speaking. And that's the key, guys. If you're if you're scared to be on a podcast or in front of a camera, then you're then you're restricted to uh, the written word, which is great. But in this day and age, with millennials and Gen Z and so on, guys, it's video. <laughs> all right, I appreciate you're definitely reinforcing what we're saying uh, all the time. So that's great. So I want to get a little bit into now, actually, what you do for clients. Um, you had talked about compliance work. And so I always like, and you said you have a, an email that goes out that talks about people that have been in trouble, gotten you know law enforcement actions on them. And we like, we call it the tax fraud blotter. We talk about tax preparers and fraud and business owners. So we, we, we know there's an audience to read about it as well. So what are some of the most, the crazy things that you've seen business owners do that they may not know they're doing wrong that gets them, leads them in trouble? There's a couple of things that small businesses and entrepreneurs do that are are terribly wrong. One of which is they pay people in cash. Okay, they pay them under the table. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Number one rule. Okay. <laughs> the second is misclassification. The Labor Department estimates that seventy percent of all U.S. businesses misclassify workers, either as hourly versus salary, exempt or non-exempt from overtime, or independent contractor versus employee. And a lot of new businesses and small businesses particularly like to pay people as independent contractors. It's easier. It's simple. There's less reporting. There's not deposits. There's no W-2s. You know, it's, it's, there's no state withholding. There's no federal withholding. All, yeah, it's easier. And if they're an employee and you don't get to decide that, that's a matter of law. And there's a whole body of law determining that. And if you put them as an independent contractor and they should be an employee, the penalties and interest can be substantial. And we get people all the time that get caught on that. And we get clients periodically that come to us and say, yeah, I know I'm doing it wrong and I need to get legal. So let's let's put everybody on payroll. And uh, they say, well, what should we do about the past stuff? And I say, in reality, Play audit roulette. I was going to say pray, but yes. <laughs> but you 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 play audit roulette, and if you don't get audited in three years, you get away with it. If you get audited, you're going to pay. Well, if you confess now, you're going to pay anyway. So <laughs> I like the audit. Uh, yeah, give it the three years, and if you get caught, you get caught. So a couple things you said. One is paying cash, um, and there's there's problem here with the 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 cash too. Is the employee who's being paid cash, they're missing out on their social security and everything else that, that should be added. So there are victims here when you do that. How do you kind of consult with your business owners to explain that side to them or even the employees sometimes? Well, I don't talk to the employees normally okay. because if they're getting paid under the table or in cash, I don't want to talk to them because, you know, I remember one time I went to a roofing company to deliver a payroll and there's 30 Mexicans standing in the parking lot, all that have roofing knives on their belt. But they don't work they were, they were very happy to see me because I had their paychecks. Right. Okay. I explained to, to clients that this is not smart. If here, here's the here's the killer. If you're paying these people as independent contractors and you terminate their arrangement and they go down and file for unemployment, you're caught. Right. It takes one person one time. It takes one wife writing a letter to the local, the state unemployment people saying, my husband's really an employee and they're paying him as an independent contractor. Within two weeks, the auditor will be out. That's They're looking for you. Right. They want to find you. If they hear anything about you on that basis, you're toast. <laughs> yeah, no, that's... Uh... That's definitely a concern of people, but they don't get that. So then let's talk about people who really are, in some respects, independent contractors by common sense, but the laws dictate they're not. And then in California, I'll give an example is truckers. So all these truckers want to be independent contractors. They don't want to be employees. They don't want to have all the overhead. They want the freedom. But then government comes in and makes legislation that says, no, this, you know, these are the rules that you have to abide by them. How do you consult? Because the, the employer has that pushback. 
So they may have problems attracting people. They say, you know, we're going to play by the rule. But what kind of what advice or what do you what do you say to that scenario? I recommend playing by the rules. Okay. It's it's just not worth it to cheat the government because the government always wins. Okay. The government may be wrong. Call your reps, call your congressmen, call your state reps, your state senators, bitch, write letters, join organizations. As you've seen in California, things have been changed. I fully expect the trucking thing to change. Yep. Okay. Because only in California. Right. Once they drive into Nevada, they're independent contractors. Crazy, okay? huh? <laughs> it's it's insane. So uh, but yeah, the I mean Uber and Lyft spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to get the law changed. Uh, and the law that, you know, when they passed Senate Bill 8, they had to go back a few months later and amend things because they unintended consequences, this whole truckers thing. Uh, and there's some things nationally in statutory employees and statutory non-employees that you have to be aware of. People who should be independent contractors or shouldn't be that by statute are. So you need to be aware of those. California is at the moment the most egregious of these, trying to change employment law and not paying attention to the um, consequences of doing so. Yeah, very true. So let's pivot a little bit. I want to get into the business owner, you know, that I'm running. I'm busy. I obviously there might be a recession, there's inflation. I have all these concerns as a business owner. You know, my my time is tight and my head is spinning all the time. But what is the most common DIY issues you see when you onboard a new business to your system that they, the mistakes they've made or things they've forgotten or didn't know, as you said, if you don't know what you don't know. So what are kind of some of the, the most common DIY mistakes you see? They're not filing with all the states. They're not making their deposits timely. They're not filing all their forms. They are misclassifying people. Uh, the, these are, are are quite common with small businesses, and they, to the most point, they realize they have problems. It's just that they've been too busy, too tight on money, too many things going on to address them. And when they get to that point, they come to me and say, help. And, you know, okay, great. Let's get you legal. Let's get you kosher with all the states and, and so on. And, and, you know, we'll work with them and show them how to do it and help them do it because uh, they need to do it because if they don't sooner or later, they're going to get caught and in many cases put out of business. I think a lot of business owners too look at it as that's when you get that feeling of like the bureaucracy is just, you know, it's hard enough to run a business as it is. And then to add all these layers of complexity in some respects, uh, I think business owners get a little angry. You know, it's just like, why is this? And rightfully so. And and because there are huge numbers of unfunded mandates on business by government. We're required to do things over and over and over, whether it be uh, taxes, it be insurance, it be HR regulations, it be how you hire people, how you fire people, what you can ask for, what you can't ask for, questions you can ask, ask. You know, you can't now in New York, you can't ask them what they used to make. Okay. It's it's insane what government does, and they don't pay us to do it because my clients have the same problems I have. I have a staff, I have taxes, I have payroll, you know, <clears throat> so I fully understand where they're at. And it is crazy what government forces on small business without, you know, they force us to take on costs that they're unwilling to take on and they force it onto us. That's not right. And I bitch at my congressman on a regular basis. <laughs> I bet you do. And I bet you know him. Uh, it's interesting, too. I think in the tax profession, just with the way the IRS made some rules on certain tax credits, that they're putting the onus on the accountant to make yes. sure that you know we're basically the police force for the IRS. The, the whole due diligence that you have to go through on a, on a tax return now and ask all these questions and so on, it's none of our damn business. We're preparing taxes. We're not enforcing the law. That's not our job. But yet the IRS, Congress has forced the IRS to make us an arm of the IRS. And that's not right. But it's the law. Um, 
All right. So I'm going to go back to talking about setting up a a practice, uh, a payroll practice. I know you said you work with private label, private label for other accounting firms. Explain yes. to me if you were sitting back right now as a CPA firm, a generalist, and let's say you had a couple hundred business clients, what would motivate you to expand into payroll side and kind of how would you tackle it in setting that side of the practice up? Well, your clients are doing payroll one way or another. You may be doing an after the fact payroll for them. They're doing it in house, which is a mistake. Uh, they will screw it up, I promise you. Or they're using a service bureau and you're getting no share of the revenue. You may be referring them to paychecks and they send you a check for 200 bucks and that client spends $5,000 next year with, with paychecks and the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year and you got your 200 bucks and paychecks has forgotten about you. I promise you, they don't, they don't care about you. Uh, other than, can you provide them more clients? So you're giving up substantial revenue, you're giving up control, you're giving up the ability to tie your client tighter to you. If you're doing their payroll and their accounting and their taxes and helping them with their HR and their benefits and their retirement programs, they ain't going anywhere until you die. That's your moat, basically. Yeah. It, um, it, it builds barriers to competition to keep them from stealing your clients. Look, I've, I've been a, an accountant. I've been a practicing CPA. I understand that. I've had clients poached from me. Okay. I had a very good one poached from me by a firm that, that sidled up to me and long story. Anyway, so I understand. And payroll helped us when we were an accounting firm and a payroll company to keep those people away from us. So if I were an accounting firm today, I would be doing payroll one way or another. If I didn't want to take on the expense and the training of doing it, I would do a white label system where I would share the revenue or I would do a referral with a, a, a firm like us that guarantees that they're going to take care of your clients, share the revenue with you uh, and keep them happy. Uh, you know, you go with some ADP is the biggest of them, of course. Every client to ADP is a number. I listened to Carlos Rodriguez say one year that to the in an analyst meeting that their job that year was to get everybody to book uh, pricing or above. Uh, they, they will rape your clients uh, deliberately and maliciously uh, unless they bitch. And you're not getting anything for that. So why are you giving away money? Sorry, I, 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 you know, it doesn't cost you anything. You can do this and you can, you can share in the, in the revenue stream on an ongoing basis. And you can either do the work or not do the work. It's up to you. If you do the work, you share a little more revenue. If you don't do the work, you share a little less, but you still share revenue on an ongoing basis for the life of the client. Why are you doing anything else? I'm sorry. Got it. Um, so a question then about, you had mentioned, I have two questions actually. So you had mentioned crypto tax. I'm going to go to that second. Um, but, but, but on the digital side, have you seen an influx of client demands that they want to digitize more of the intake process, whether that be working with you, sharing files, whatever? Like how do you deal with that side versus kind of what I call the legacy workflows, paper-based workflows, Excel spreadsheets, whatever. No, absolutely. HCM, human capital management, is nothing but uh, digitizing all that flow. And yes, people want to do it. Uh, they'll pay for it, okay, which is great. But electronic timekeeping, uh, full integration, uh, onboarding, full integration, all that is, is, is much more common and much more desirable Yes, there's an expense to the client, but when they look at the time savings, they go, phew, yeah. So it costs me an extra 50 bucks a month. Who cares? It, it saves me hours. Um, all of the systems should be integrated from start to finish. So when, they, when, when, when HR puts somebody in, when they hire somebody, which has gone through the onboarding system, then they say they're hired. They appear in the time clock. 
they're ready to punch in and go or swipe or whatever they do. Okay. And that flows right through. And then the payroll, the, the manager has his payroll report to review and say, yeah, I'm happy with that. Hit the button, payroll processes. Yeah, it that that's the way the world is going and properly so. Saves right. everybody time. Yeah, I mean, we consider it a differentiator. We're heavy on what we do for our system is we digitize client-facing experiences. So we're trying to assist the accountants in everything from how they present their proposal, how they get paid, how people schedule uh, time with them on their calendar, uh, to actually intake forms, engagement letters. So digitize the entire process. Go ahead. Absolutely. And up to and including <laughs> such things as we produce a GL file for the accountant that he then just imports into his accounting system. Okay. So it's seamless to him. The payroll to him is import that report and he's done. And we work with the accountants on, okay, how do you want the GLs? How is the GL structured? What do you want to go where? How much detail do you want? I mean, we can go down to, uh, we want detail by department, uh, by state or, you know, for unemployment purposes, or we can say, no, lump all the taxes in one. It's whatever the accountant and the client want. This is a level of detail and it's part of the setup process. But once it's done, man, boom. So would you consider that a competitive advantage from one accounting firm to another that's still, you know, I guess, locked in the dark ages? I mean, oh, ab absolutely. Believe me. When I, I remember a client, I, when I was in industry before I um, started this firm, um, where the outside auditor was still doing paper and ink ledgers. This was 1984, okay? We had computerized systems. He was still doing paper and ink ledgers <laughs> and ledger books, uh, which I'd seen in college, but I never right. had to do. <laughs> now, the world has changed. And All right. you, need, you need to be on top of this stuff because if you don't, your competitors are, and they will take your clients. I'm sorry. You, you've got to be, you've got to be, on the leading edge, not, uh, and that there's a difference between the cutting edge and the leading edge, but you can't be 20 years out of date. Yeah, I think a lot of accountants get caught in the, they're risk adverse, they don't like making changes the same way as last year. And we still see, we did a survey and I think it was like 57% are still doing all sorts of, of handwritten you know workflows. And I'm like, how did you do that through the pandemic? And some would say, well, <laughs> we didn't work, you know, and then, and then now they're, they're trying to open up and getting into it. Um, all right. So I'm going to go to what I find very interesting. And I, I'm assuming this is purely a content marketing, digital marketing introduction, but you got into crypto payroll. So explain to me, A, what is crypto payroll? And B, how do you market? How do you find clients? How are they finding you to, to, to do that offering? Well, <clears throat> we have two, two different functions of crypto payroll. One where they can, the employee can take and have part of his payroll deposited as crypto pay, as Bitcoin in cold storage. The other is he can have it deposited in a uh, crypto exchange where he then has a wallet and he can convert it to whatever crypto he wants. Uh, the, the Bitcoin is, is without cost. The uh, wallet and exchange has a cost to it, as all exchanges do. But what we've done is we've, and we're the first payroll company to offer this to their clients. There, ha, there are a few companies that offer it to their employees, but we're the first one to offer it to the public like this. And we're getting some good play, though the most recent couple of months with Bitcoin falling out of bed and so on has, has caused some slowdown in the interest. It will pick back up. But, and we're, we're doing podcasts, we're doing crypto podcasts. Uh, we're marketing that uh, in the crypto area to interested parties. We're doing videos and so on uh, because it, it is very much leading edge and it establishes us as a thought leader in the industry. Uh, we're doing things that our competitors don't. Therefore, we are smarter, sharper, more up to date, more current. Uh, differentiating more for sure, right? You can stand out as something you can talk about. Sure. 
Exactly. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the 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 all the some of the breaches, security breaches, and the the wallet side and all that would give me pause. But it's interesting that um, people, you know, at this a lot of people that's their preference, right? That's how they would like to get paid. Been very very careful about the partners we've selected in this. These are established uh, firms. They're not new. They're not fly by night. Uh, they're insured. They work with a top tier bank. Uh, they have all the audits. They have all the controls. We don't work with Joe Blow's crypto exchange. Right. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, I watched a Netflix about a, a guy in Canada who that I mean, it was the story just made me uh, pause a lot. Um, so is there anything that I have missed that you would like to add just purely from so again, to talking to my audience about things that you've learned, successes, things that they maybe should consider when looking at doing a payroll site. Well, again, the biggest thing with payroll in this day and age is the compliance. And you, if you need to either be prepared to deal with that or you need to outsource that. Uh, if you're set up for it and you can do it, great. You can make more money doing it. Okay. If you're not Believe me, it's it's not something you're going to learn in a week. It, it is a long, intensive process. I've spent 30 years and I still learn stuff every day or every week. So, uh, but knowledge is power. Power is money. However you want to look at it, uh, the more competent you are and can do things for your clients, the more money you can make. But you can't do everything for everybody. You've got to pick and choose. So uh, I think your philosophy on that is 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 spot on for growth. Um, I appreciate that. So you had mentioned a, a book and uh, people can download yeah. and let's, oh. Well, it, not, no, not, not, not download, it's book. a printed book. It's a printed book. Wiley was my publisher on it. This okay. is a real book. You can get it on Amazon if you want, but if they will go to the payrollbook.com, enter the discount code podcast, we will ship them at no cost a free book as long as supplies last. All right. Your listeners. And I will put that in the description to everybody. So it would be easy to find and uh, to download. And obviously, how long is the book? How long does it take to read? It's uh, 95,000 words. It's not an afternoon. It's, it's, it's a book. I mean, it covers, it's 30 years of wisdom distilled down to 95,000 words. Perfect. But it's, that's an easy MBA, so to speak. So um, I think that would be uh, well worth my audience's time. Um, so a couple of things in closing, just for uh, people that are on the CountyWorks Pro platform or are thinking about it, we do help clients basically identify which niches to work on. We help them create targeted, whether that be a microsite with a blog that could be a content-driven solution where you're just, for example, you're doing payroll for dental firms. That could be a way to niche down. That's a way to stand out from all the generalists and, and is a way to stand out from national firms and other things. So we do that for our clients. We help them um, identify which area they should uh, go after. And one of the things you said in the beginning is passion. Do something that you love. And if you love it, you're going to be successful. I think your clients can feel it and hear it in your voice. And I mean, obviously, you said you've been doing this for 30 plus years. So the expertise you have gained or that time period, I'm assuming makes it much easier for you to do your job. I mean, you're, you're doing it, you're loving it, and it takes much less time because you know the answers. Is that kind of a good summary of that? It is, but <clears throat> you, you, you've you got to stay on top of it. I mean, I get several newsletters a week from the IRS. I get trade journals. I get tax letters. I go uh, have webinars and conferences. It's an ever-changing environment. And the moment you stop learning you're in trouble uh, because so much of it, you know, when the PPP came and other things, if you weren't on top of that, uh, you were cheating your clients. Uh, so you've got to stay on top of these things. You've start, got to stay current on it. Uh, and I, I'm a life, I'm a lifelong learner. Okay. Uh, that's why I became a U.S. tax court practitioner. Uh, I, I like to learn. I love to learn. So I'm constantly learning new things and you've got to stay on top of things. You can't, you can't be 20 years out of date. You can't do it. Not be successful. Well, I appreciate it. I might take that snippet from this uh, podcast and, and use it on LinkedIn for a few things. 
So if I were a small business owner and looking to work with you or an accountant who just wanted to learn and talk to you, how would I contact you other than the book? Uh, getpayroll.com on the web. My email is cjr at getpayroll. And frankly, 972-353-0000. Ask for Charles. I'll talk to you. There we go. Charles has given his phone number away. That's how I love that. And that's part about building relationships. And I think people forget in a digital age, it's still about connecting with people. It's still about having human interaction. Um, I appreciate it, Charles, the time you spent. I hope our audience has some good takeaways from this, has learned some things, not only from, you know, whether or not you want to specialize in, in payroll, um, but also as a business owner, understanding the pitfalls with compliance issues, DIY work, and it, really with all these states and classifications, it gets really complex and it can become a, can become a big mess. So again, Charles, thanks again for spending some time with us. I appreciate it. And hopefully we'll see you guys again on our Growth Minded Account podcast. We have uh, a series of another like four or five people lined up that are all going to be exciting um, subjects and topics that we'll talk about here in the coming months. So I do appreciate it. Thank you, Charles. Pleasure.